our events. Uh, I love uh, seeing people get up here and like speak passionately about things they really know a lot about. Um, I wanted to do this last season, uh, but we sort of ran out of time, so I already had a, a bunch of slides. But when I had this date in mind, um, you know, so many could be improved upon, and then I did like double down. So I feel like I'm deep in World War One trenches. We've got a lot of slides. We've got a lot of slides to go through, and also um, I am a children's book illustrator, so this basically came out as a really good assembly for like eight to thirteen. Months. <laughs> You know, enjoy, enjoy the pretty pictures. Maybe you'll also learn something. All right, so uh, cartoon World War One. All right, so this is like this is what this is what Europe looked like at the start of World War One. Um, Germany controlled uh, Germany and Austria Hungary controlled a really big portion of Europe. They had just taken Alsace Lorraine, which is like a beautiful rolling French, very French area. The French were pissed off about it. Um, and then Serbia, I mean, there was a bitter war going on for very many years between Austria-Hungary, Tur Turkey, and Serbia. But Serbia still had that, that, that lock to the sea. But then, okay, and also the, uh, the chancellor of Austria-Hungary was like a complete dick. He, he had this like uh, like like gimpy arm, and he was just like it made him have this complex. So he was just like a total dick to everybody. He was like internationally, like everybody hated him, like the, the rich people, the poor people. So what basically what happened is the uh, the heir to his throne, uh, Franz Ferdinand, which is where that comes from. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he um, he's on parades like I'm the you know I'm the Rich, like, I don't know, Scott Disick of Austria. <laughs> and he's on his car. And then this awesome, like, assassin team, the Black Hands yes. from Serbia. They're like, they're all these young kids, and they're just like, so, like, we, this is our land. Um, he goes to one of these parades, these Black Hands throw a bomb, and it kills five, like, soldiers protecting Franz Ferdinand, but not Franz Ferdinand. And then, Franz Ferdinand, being the dumbass that he is, does the same thing, a little parade, to the hospital of the injured people who just got blown up in a bomb, and then some young kid, like a 16 or 17 year old, shot him straight through the neck and killed him, which was a huge problem. And now this, this is the complex Venn diagram of alliances during World War I. So if you see this highlight, Serbia attacks Austro Austria, Hungary, so, right back, Austria-Hungary uh, attacks Serbia. And then Russia, who is aligned with Serbia, has to attack Austria-Hungary. And now Germany, who's aligned with Austria-Hungary, they're just they're like, love war. They have guns. They really, really want to get to war. So immediately, immediately they, they start fighting in both directions. And they're like, the best way to get to France, the peace we won, is through Belgium. And then so Belgium, I mean, believe it or not, France, Germany, and Russia used to be a, um, you no know, alliance. But they broke that up, but Russia and France were still alliance. So Russia going to war caused France to go to war, and when they went through Belgium, England had to get into it. All over this one dude. But also because they were all revved up anyway, like everybody wow. Everybody wanted to go to war. So Austria-Hungary attacks, attacks Serbia. At that point, Russia, Russia puts up its defenses against Germany and Austria-Hungary. Um, okay. They're not, they're not, okay, what the thing is, is Russia is like at the state of everything, not willing to give up this, like from the water to Russia. Because they already have this, they can't get supplies through here, so Russia has to get all the supplies through here. And if they lose that, they, I mean, they're already, like, in an awful Russian place, so, like, <laughs> <laughs> like they need that. So they are just not willing to give anything up. And then, the insane Germans, uh, they call it, they, like, war's on, let's do it. They call this, uh, it's called the Schiffen Plan. First, they're going to take France, then they're going to take Belgium, then Luxembourg, then we're going to deal with Russia, Africa, and then eventually take
take the Netherlands. This is the plan. I mean, it sounds like a crazy plan, but like, um, this is how like serious they were. This is how like nuts they were. This is how like full of themselves they thought. You know, this is how big they thought themselves. Like we are. This is what we're gonna do. This, of course, this is what we're gonna do. Okay, but as not Austria Hungary attacked Serbia in the first battle. Uh, what's it called? Ser and Kubara, they attack Serbia, but Serbia is full of like, this is our country. They're still like, you cannot have this. They're still revved up from like calling the war. So they actually <coughs> defeat the Austria Hungarians in the first two battles. And this like does a psychological thing to the Austria Hungarians. Like, oh damn, like we misunderestimated these Serbians. <laughs> in the meantime, when Germany goes through Belgium, they are awful. They are totally awful. I don't, you know, I didn't research this, but they must have some. <laughs> because they, it's called the Rape of Belgium. They just literally killed like 75,000 citizens. Just bombed indiscriminately, just rolling through. And Belgium has hardly anything, like National Guard people, you know? So they just ran through. And this is like when the war is like really starting. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, the British, of course, being an island, have like the best <laughs> navy possible. <laughs> and they're, they've got like, they're starting to have dreadnoughts, and battleships, like real seafaring firepower. So they're leading, and they're doing a German blockade, but in a much sneakier way. Uh, and the only way they could go, because they're not going to build bigger battleships, they build these. U-boats, submarines, that were used in the Civil War, people were experiment experimenting with them. And I thought they were going to be like really crappy, but I researched it and they really, I mean they weren't, they looked like this. But they were cramped, <laughs> there was like coal and petroleum gases inside the, the things, but they were very effective at sneaking up on people and blowing them. So in this like side... <laughs> Air battles going at the beginning of the war. Zeppelins are what's happening. It's giant, you know what they are. You know, like not a hot air balloon, you know, not the blimp, but like the metal blimp. So uh, this, is like, this is what they appear like over a cityscape. This is like sort of how big they are. There wasn't like Raven Stadium in the in like back then, but I kind of drew it in just to show you like the <laughs> and scale of a Zeppelin. Um, what else? Okay, on, Rus on, on the Russian end, it's a huge space. So what's happening basically is they're like, we're going to get into the trenches, but Russia never forms trenches because it's really spread out, the communication's really bad, and it's this constant thing of like, an army will get together, they'll get all psyched up, and they'll like kill a bunch of uh, Russians, and then they'll rush forward, but there's no way to reinforce that win. So then it comes back, and then the Russians will do the same thing, but it's so wide open. It's always this weird fluid line that never really gets anywhere. That's basically like a meat grinder of death. And then while, <laughs> since, since Germany is sneaking in this way, they start to have battles right in here. And basically, <laughs> from when they call the war, in April, I think, that year, to December that year. Everybody was like, this war is going to be over by December. Like, we're going to have Christmas at home soldiers. That's what, that's, what, that's what a lot of the French generals and British people were like, join this war, we'll have you home by Christmas. <laughs> by Christmas, they had formed a, like, deeply sunk-in trench line all the way from the start of Luxembourg all the way to the ocean, the, the, the northern part of France. Um, and like I said, they thought the very first year in 1914, Christmas 1914, everybody put down their arms, they like grabbed instruments, they played Christmas songs together, they ate food, they slowly crossed the barbed wire, and they had this thing, they're like, oh, you know, like, well, oh, it'll be over soon. And this was obviously the last year that like opposing enemies really got down. Because the rest of the war is just horribly devastating. Now, there's some new, uh, Inventions, new technology, and weapons that really shaped what World War I was. These are like the general um, 
This is like the general what everybody carry. This was actually used, <laughs> this was actually used a very lot in close trench trench battles. But the real uh, the real technology that um, you know changed this into a different war was the machine gun. Um, and then also well, no, that was like you know forefront of the kind of technology that they had. Then on the other hand, they people like carry around like size and like maces <laughs> to, for when they got close together, you know, um, which often happened. And the other two invented two technologies really shaped World War One, and it's the machine gun and barbed wire. Barbed wire wasn't even invented till 1863 by a cattle farmer in like Wyoming or something. So it hadn't like the potential of it hadn't been. Utilized in any war before, but it, it was the thing that kept like troops from like just marching into a battlefield, or or trucks being able to support them. They would all become entangled. You couldn't cross, and then be having slow movement to get to your objective allowed these machine guns to just mow you down. Um, people would get stuck in the, in the barbed wire. And, you know, they'd be like healthy humans, or like you know, at like. 65% humans, and they're running with their guns, and then they get caught in this thing, and they're not dead. And it just slowly goes from like 65 to 50 to like 42, like slowly, they get shot through the legs slowly, the, the barbed wire's digging in more deeply. It was like a death of many World War I soldiers. So, they can't run at each other, what are they gonna do? They were all issued these like, see, you've seen them, these are like shovels like this big, so they can hang them on their backpacks. So they dug these trenches in, these holes, so they couldn't be like fired at straight upon. And then, I mean, this is like an overhead view. They would have like uh, if you're looking at an overhead, and they had like crazy complex trench systems. Um, and you could go back into them. They had reserves. You can go into the medical. They had communications lines running down to other trench systems and munitions places to get. And I mean, this was the Western Front of the war, a whole trench system. And there were riflemen who just stood at the edge of the trench and just fired off. Uh, so the thing to do was just, just fire for maybe hours artillery, huge shells into the other, into the, uh, enemy's battleground and just try to like decimate them as much as possible, try to blow their trenches up, try to disrupt them as much as possible, and then just like get insane and over the top, use ladders, run over the top of your trenches and try to capture the, their trenches. But like I said, machine guns were around now. It wasn't like shoot, shoot, it was like like sprays of bullets going across people. So the over the top thing, even if the people had like a fraction of the machine guns on the other side, the, the attackers would still get mowed down. And the trenches turned into like awful, like the worst conditions in the world. Like there were, there was like, you know, opaque mud, the sides of these dirt uh, trenches were caving in. There was lots of sickness, lots of rot, there was rats and lice. And there, you know, there's like blood, like oil slicks on top of the like rainwater. Uh, in the summer, it was deadly hot. Like it was a, it, like throughout the whole war, it was like extremes. In the summer, it was like deadly hot. And and you got to remember, like their their uniforms is like 1915, right? There's like canvas, like wool, and they couldn't really take them off. They got nothing else. And then in the winter, it was absolutely awful. There's no like there's there's no getting out of the weather in this war either. Um, here's some things that were also part of trench life. These are called sappers who made these like really <laughs> rudimentary tunnels under the trenches to try to get around and trick people. Um, very brave or very forced men who did this, like digging underneath. A lot of the time it would cave in. There's, you know, they needed reinforcements all the time. People would get trapped by getting the, you know, cave in here, cave in here. Here's a few men, and it was impossible to communicate with each other. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, like, like iPhone, text, like, <laughs> yo, like, coming, it's like coming your way. Like, it, it was more like, 
And then even that, like, who knows? It could have been snipped. It could have been blown up. Lots of stuff were getting blown up. So some of the tactics they would use is uh, this kind of shows they would, they would have these pigeons. Yeah! Like, <laughs> I remember that one. They have these pigeons like, wrapped up in canvas, and then they would shoot them out of cannons to try to get them to their own size. And then when the, the pigeon would get there, they would, they would unwrap the pigeon, attach their message, and see if the pigeon would fly back to them. Poor um, pigeon. <laughs> they don't know that. Um, uh, also, dogs were used a lot in, in the army to carry supplies to like, sniff out enemies as scouts, uh, taking supplies to the front. They would make, uh, they would, like, the whole area, most of the areas were completely bombed out. So they would have these uh, dug out, like, kind of periscope trees. This is one of the tactics to see, uh, you know, far, see through the war. And then, um, so, you know, so many people died, and we'll get into the numbers, it's like, absolutely grisly. Um, so, so people, and, and, but like, you can triple that number of the people who were like, horribly inflicted by the war. Like, the, the, the injuries that they, that were inflicted upon them, and, um, and then medics, like 19, 15s medics, would be running around, and still they couldn't be killed because of like trees. But, I mean, what were they going to do? Like, they had nothing to do. And then, like, for example, like the German, like, blockade, there was, like, no medicine going into Germany anymore because of the British blockade of Germany. And um, so they were, like, they were, like, tending wounds with, like, linen and just, like, random scraps of fabric. And, I mean, it was... Oh, and people were going through, like, if you can imagine, even, like, going through any of this, if you can imagine, like, the things that make you really upset in your life now, like, imagine, <laughs> like, living in these death, like, organic death buckets of, of, of the trench system. And, 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 and the thing about the trench system is that um, it would be days when 10, 20,000 people would die in one day or over the course of a weekend. And then you would, it would be this, like, really tense waiting game. And they could wait a month, they could wait two days. They didn't know when they were going to have to go over the top again. So they were never able to relax. So even men were driven mad in times where they weren't going over the top and weren't on a crusade. At least the, at least the four progress kept their mind off of the crushing death that they inevitably were going to face. And then, <laughs> and then we get into the gas. Now, this is the first war where gas was really used as a battle tactic. Um, the first place was in Ypres. Ypres, man. Um, it was the Germans who acted first. And the, and the first things they had were like tear gas, which is like cops on TV. And then um, <laughs> the, the, the other thing that, the other thing that they had was mustard gas. Mustard gas wouldn't really kill you, but it would make you really break out in blisters, your skin wouldn't peel, would become hard and flaky, and um, it, it wasn't it wasn't what killed you. It was open sores. It was like the wounds that would cause in these death buckets of trenches and in this like environment that they were creating in this battlefield. So that's why mustard gas was really. Um, oh, and in the beginning, like they they didn't think they weren't like oh we should like put this in a bullet. They would literally have cans of this like. Uh, chemical, like, chemical gas, and they would try to, like, run down wind and then, like, open up the can, or they would have, like, large, like, mylar bags that they would pump the gas out of to try to get them down wind, which was really unreliable because, like, the wind, for example, <laughs> it often come back on them. Um, it created a really bad scene on, in, in, in the trenches. That later, other chemicals, gassing chemicals were introduced. For example, chlorine was introduced and did, could kill you, and did, and did a lot in the beginning. But then, what you have to remember is chlorine is water soluble. So basically, they figured out that if you just put a wet rag over your face, that could kind of block out some of the chlorine and make you still able to go forward. But then, um, later on, they, they, they developed this chemical. Phosgene, 
And it had this like really ominous, they call it moldy hay smell. It was the only way you knew it was coming. It was undetectable by dogs. Um, and it turned, once it went to your lungs, it turned into hydrochloric acid. Oh. Um, this is, I found this in a book, but it was like a leather glove that was like, uh, you know, submitted to phosgene, which shriveled up even the dead skin. And then, like, to combat that, there was really, like, all kind of, like, really uh, prehistoric ways to, I mean, they had, like, cloth goggles. I mean, what I'm saying is they eventually put it in bullets. They figured that out. So, uh, like, artillery bullets, big bullets. And you see here, these are, like, these are, like, wet things that they try to put over their nose. And I said, like, this is their idea of, like, gas masks. They would put, like, a wet, like, feed bag over the horse to try to keep it alive. And, um... But also the gas thing was awful because it was like really messing with their minds. So as the war went on, by the end of the war, they were producing more gas, more effective gas masks than there were soldiers left to fight. So they really got on that. They were like, we, we need to address this. And horses, like I said, horses were also like, this is the early 1900s, so horses are like a super important part of like of the war, there weren't like cars were like kind of the new thing. Truck, trucks were generally a new thing. Horses, they still had like hundreds of thousands of horses, so they used these to drag things to war, to bring artillery. They actually still used them as cavalry. They would drag huge weapons to the fronts, uh, and it's just to show you like how far ago and the, and the different methods that they had to use. Okay, so we are going to switch to the. Uh, Austrian Hungary in front, front right now to the Battle of Gallipoli, which was controlled by German, Austria, Hungary, Turkey. But it was a key, it's a key place because, I mean, this, I'm not going into this right now. This is based, like all this, Serbia, Serbia, all these places are getting overrun by the Austria Hungarians by this point. The, the, Austria, the uh, Serbians did really well in the beginning, but like, after that initial adrenaline rush of blocking the Austrian Hungarians, they couldn't, they weren't a real army. So they basically are all mired up in here. So we really wanted this space to get stuff to Russia. But this was all controlled by Turkey. So the boy, a young Winston Churchill, is like kind of an admiral at the army, and he is like a really privileged noble. You know, he's like, and he like instantly. He rises up the ranks for no reason. Uh, <laughs> of the uh, uh, like British military. So he's like, how am I gonna make, make a name for myself here? I'm gonna go get Gallipoli. I'm gonna be this like superhero who like gets like frees this up, gets stuff to Russia. I could possibly like change the course of the war. So and, he, and he's saying this and, and um like, it's like just generally known. You need like ships to get there and then like a landing crew to like get onto the land. And what, and he's the army, he's the navy, and the army's like, no way, man, we have everything tied up. Like, we can't give you any soldiers. And he's like, and he's like okay, that's fine. I'll just go over with these boats. So, like, against like everybody's judgment, he just loads like 250 soldiers onto these boats. Heads down, past like through the Mediterranean Ocean to to Gallipoli, and um, I mean, really, they had like fishing boats that like had tin on the like nailed onto them to try to do all the mine sweeping. Like they did not have good equipment down in Gallipoli, um, and then the night like they're getting ready. It took them a really long time to get this force together to try to attack these Turks. So there was no surprise attack. At all. And then also, they saw them sweeping the mines the whole time. They saw them getting ready at this island, and they saw them sweeping the mines. So, like, the Turks had a really long time to get ready. So, General Patan, who was the, uh, maybe that's not his name. The general who was leading the battle, the British general who was leading the battle for this globally. Like, Churchill was in England, like, calling the shots. This guy who was actually running it down in Gallipoli, they swept the mines, we're gonna go, gonna go attack tomorrow, has a mental breakdown, 
just we quits, can't like be really consoled at all. The night before, he sees like the writing on the wall. He's like, no way, like I can't even move. Like I, I can't even think. Like so he he like they get him out of there. They um they, they get him out of there and they're like uh, but they like lose time. It's really confusing. They get another general in there, but it gives the Turks one more time to lay a whole bunch of new mines. So in just that one day, they lay all these new mines. They thought they swept for mines, but when they go in, they're the battleships and all these like converted boats that they brought were just blowing the smithereens. And they're looking to these hills up on, because uh, it's not like the Jersey Shore is like a quarter mile of nice white sand, but <laughs> not white sand, you know. Uh, it's like these rocky, muddy hills going up. So they're looking, they're thinking the shots are coming down and blowing them up from above. They didn't even expect the mines to be there. It's just like, they didn't even think of it. Um, and then also, when they got, when they landed, when they would get there, they outnumbered the Turks six to one, but they like didn't think anything of the Turks. They're like, oh, it's like barbarians. We're gonna like bring on, bring it to them. But they were all stationed like, like I said, there was like a lot of slopes when it came to like Constantinople and Gallipoli in the straits there, and they just they, they had the complete advantage. They just had a tons of, of of firepower shooting down, and and uh, many many soldiers. All the British colonies uh, were killed. 250,000 uh, allies were killed. And like I said, a sixth, a sixth of that for turkeys. So, Winston uh, starts to win or loses this, and he's like, and you know, he's probably depressed, and his generals are like, like, get out of here. So he literally goes to the south of France and just paints for six months. He just like paints, like, <laughs> so then he gets back to he gets back to England, and um, since he's still a noble, like people think they owe him stuff, he becomes the uh, manager of like munitions, getting guns, and actually, before the war is over, they have more bullets than they could possibly ever do. He does like do something in World War One, and then of course, you know, World War Two, big guy. Um, <laughs> Okay, so back to the Russian map. Like I said before, the Russians are like a stiff-ass people. They don't have as much as a Germany, because Germany had like some of the best weapons in the whole, all of Europe, like in all of the war. They have a, like a lot of the best stuff. But the Germans aren't, uh, the German or the Russians don't have all that stuff, but they're like, they're just hard asses. They just keep the, the Germans and the Austrian Hungarians like just pinned down. Um, but it was a grim reality for Russian Russian soldiers. Like there was not a volunteer army. Like you were forced to fight, and, and they didn't want to fight. Like uh, many of them didn't want to fight. Sure, there was like nationalism going on, and like da, da, da. also they had just been like like totally embarrassed in the. Uh, Russian Japo War? I don't know. That, Japanese Russian War. Um, like, they, like, on the east side of Russia, they just got killed. Like, they didn't expect the Japanese people to do anything, but the Japanese people had big, like, better airplanes, like, awesomer machine guns, and they just got, like, embarrassed. There's this one story about that war where the Russians just got so wasted one night after, you know, like, vodka, like, da, 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 we're in war, we hate ourselves. And then um, <laughs> uh, the Japanese, at around like four or five in the morning, came, snuck onto the battlefield, and killed twelve hundred Russians with bayonets, just running around with these drunk like Russians. And that, um, and I mean, and, um, and then this this kind of shows like uh, you know a lot of the Russians didn't want to fight, so uh, Russia routinely practiced decimation to keep the soldiers from. <laughs> fighting, they would line people up and they would kill every tenth soldier. And I guess the idea behind that is that the people who are left form this bond of being people who all went through this horrible thing together, of their friend getting killed. I don't know, I mean it's a tactic and it kind of held the army together. Around the same time, the, there was a freight ship, like a passenger freight ship, in the Atlantic Ocean, the loose Lusitania, was shot down with German U-boats. 
and it had 1,200 people on it, and 100 Americans were killed. And even though, like, you know, we could have twisted that into a lot of Americans were still like, no, we are not even getting into that, it's over there, like, we're doing our own thing here, like, we are against war, we don't want this. But that is happening around the same time. Um, like I said, they're holding it down. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and here's another thing that happened in once, <clears throat> once like Turkey had this pretty much like Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria hit, they concentrated their a lot of their force on the eastern side because Armenia was a really big. That is a sore spot for them. That's something they really wanted. But also they hated Armenians. So in like a horrible move on the like southern or eastern front, they made the Turkish people made uh, 2.5 million Armenians march to Syria, where they also weren't wanted. On the way, like 600,000 Armenians died. And by the time they got to Syria, you can count all two, like 2.5 million Armenians dead. So I don't have a lot on the Austrian-Hungary front, but horrible stuff was happening over there as well. So then.